tell a story about something that affected you in Mm. any way and let your inner monologue and your response to that drive it. I just had this happen. I just taught a class and I had a woman in the class who was a working mom in her forties, who I think has had a very exciting life. But right now this phase of her life is not as exciting as some of the things that had happened before. She had had a very rich life, lived all over the place. And right now her life was pretty stable, you know, like what you just said. And she told this great story about (laughs) <laughs> something that happened at a grocery store and a person being rude to her and everything that went on in her head and everything she wanted to say and everything that happened when she got home. And it was awesome and hilarious. And it was literally yeah. about this whole thing of what was happening on the inside versus what was actually happening in reality. And that's, and it was a story about a trip to a grocery store where the shopkeeper forgot to put something into her bag. That's it. Mm. That's it. Wow. <laughs> and it was brilliant. When I was inputting feedback for her, I said, I think your story was actually the most challenging to tell rather than some of the other ones that were about bigger things. You know, I mean, I have students that are wonderful that tell great stories about, you know, someone getting shot, big things like that. And a story like that will work because it's a big Mm -hmm. story. But most of us, most of us only have one or two big stories. And then what else do you tell after that? I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Margo, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me. It is my pleasure to have you here. So I came across your book, I believe, by way of your publicist. Uh, long story short, the only story telling guide you'll ever need. And, you know, I thought, well, that's a bold title. But now that I've read it cover to cover, I'm like, yeah, that's that's actually it lives up to the expectation. Uh, but before we get into all of that, I want to start by asking what I think is a relevant question. And that is, what is the earliest memory you have from growing up that you think planted the seed for this love that you have of storytelling? Oh, my gosh. Um it's hard to remember stuff from when I was very, very little because my interests were not um, in telling stories as much as they were in uh, my goals of being a member of the circus or a ballerina what was my goals for a long time as a child. So uh, I think that it, it began in college, which is, mm. I guess, late. Uh, I was an early bloomer for everything else in terms of height and the way I looked. I looked about 17 from age 11 on. But I think in terms of like, uh, developing what I wanted to do, do, I think that started in college. And I have a few memories of it. Uh, one of them is freshman year. Uh, I got, um, I was in dance, I was a theater major and I was in this ballet class and over Thanksgiving break, I had gone home to New Jersey and I had gotten my foot run over by a car by my ex-boyfriend from high school. Not on purpose. <laughs> what? Okay. Keep Your going. Question? We're going to have to come back to that. No, Sorry. You can, no, you can add, interrupt if you want. Yeah, no, I, I'm not going to interrupt you, but I, we have to come back to that. It was not on purpose. This is what I'm going to say. Okay. He did not do it on purpose. He could have handled it better, uh, but he did not mean to do it. And um, so, anyway, I couldn't, uh, I, I think I was on crutches when I went back to college after that, uh, after Thanksgiving break. And, uh, or maybe it was fall, it was like right at the beginning of my freshman year. And, uh, so I go back and I was walk, I, I hop into ballet class on the crutches and my teacher was this fabulous ballerina. I think she was in her sixties. She was in like JLo shape, you know, and she was like the most fabulous teacher. And her name was Eugenia Wecker Hooflin. And she was married to a much younger man. She was fabulous. And I walked in and I said, um, she was like, Marco, what happened? And I was like, well, and I remember getting in front of the ballet class on the crutches and like telling this whole story about this injury of how it happened and about this relationship I was in with this guy in high school and how it ended and it didn't end so well. And then we went run over and I told the whole like story. And, um, I remembered watching the ballerinas laugh and the teacher laugh. And then she said, well, you'll have to sit out for the next few weeks and just take notes on ballet. And what I did was I sat down, rested my foot, and then I wrote down what I had just said in my notebook. 
um, I was like, hmm, this is interesting. Try to remember what, uh, you know, what was interesting about this story. And I think that was the very first time a light bulb went off of, I liked how that, I liked how that felt much more so than any, um, anything else I was doing in that class. Although I did enjoy dancing, but I, I enjoyed that more. Hmm. Okay, so you have to tell us <laughs> in detail why this boyfriend of yours ran over your foot. I know you said he didn't do it on purpose. No, it was just, I, I, I guess it wasn't Thanksgiving. It must have been fall break. I guess we had a fall break. And I came home, and it was homecoming weekend. And I did not really uh, like high school. and But a bunch of my friends from high school wanted to go stop by the homecoming dance, which I guess is what you do if you liked high school and it was a pleasant experience for you and you wanted to revisit it. But we were yeah. all in the car and I, my ex-boyfriend was sort of like in my friend group at the time and he was driving. And I remember when I got picked up instead of getting shotgun, like I used to, when we were together, I had, I, I was I just in the back seat and I was in the back left seat. And then when we drove to the homecoming dance, we pulled into the driveway and of the high school uh, and the parking lot. And I had one foot in and one foot out of the car. And I was like, are we getting out? What are we doing? And everyone was sitting there trying to decide if we wanted to go to this dance or not. And then finally he was like, you know what, let's not go. And then he started driving, not really that the door was open and my leg was hanging out. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. So then yeah, I went, but I then he, that, but then I got dropped off. Right. He dropped me at um, my friend's mom's house. Uh, who's a nurse instead of at the local hospital <laughs> and he was like let her handle it and then she drove me to the hospital and it was, you know what I mean so that's why I say she he could have handled it a little bit better I think he didn't want to be liable it was like a hit and run <laughs> sort of but like I was you know what I mean like, it was like a very bizarre yeah. hit and run. like he tried to run but I was in the car <laughs> well uh, you know, I, I think that one of the things you mentioned was mm -hmm. that when you went back to the ballet class, you noticed that you really liked the way that you felt uh, in terms of the way people responded to this and just the experience of writing down that story. Yeah. I wonder why so many people miss moments like that in their lives. Like, I think the closest thing that I had to that uh, when I was in college was I took an entrepreneurship class. 90% of the class was doing presentations, and I got a lot of really positive feedback on my ability to do presentations. And the professor said, oh, you would be a hell of a salesperson. Mm -hmm. So I went and got jobs doing nothing but cold calling at software companies, which I hated wow. with a passion. Um, and looking back, as somebody who loves to do creative work, I feel that I wasted my time at Berkeley because there was a humor magazine I could have been a writer for. There was a school newspaper. For all I know, there might have been a radio station. Uh, and it was the infancy of the Internet. So I, I wonder what it is that causes people to miss moments like that, like the one you had. I mean, I think a lot of what you just said is accurate to it. The moment of someone else has told you this is what I'm supposed to do, or you have some set thing in your mindset that tells you this is what I'm supposed to be doing rather than this is what feels right. And believe me, I'm guilty of that more than you probably. I mean, I still, you know, got a minor in dance and studied theater and pursued theater and acting when I got out of college because that's what I had a degree in. Um, but I guess the difference is what I wanted to do in storytelling wasn't really like a tangible field. You know what I mean? Like you couldn't say I'm trying to, I'm working as an actor, but I'm trying to be work in storytelling. It's a weird thing to say, but so I think that mm. we're told someone tells us something and it sticks in our head, just like something negative sticks in our head. I mean, sometimes someone says to you, you're a terrible writer and that sticks in someone's head. One person saying you're a bad writer rather than the 30 people that have said you are. So, I mean, I think it's just a matter of believing the hype <laughs> can get in anyone's way. Yeah. So you mentioned that um, you started your career as you know, trying to be an actor. And, you know, I mean, growing up in an Indian family, we're very much discouraged yeah. from creativity you know, related stuff as careers. Like, yeah, these are nice hobbies, but it's almost as if Indian people think that books fall out of the <laughs> sky, not that people are actually writing them. Uh, you know, they don't seem to understand that. Wait a minute. Like people actually sit in a room and do this and get paid to do this. There's a reason you get to watch all these Bollywood <laughs> movies because somebody was willing to go and take this crazy risk. And what in your own experience have been the challenges of navigating uh, the uncertainty of a creative career in the oh, beginning? God. And what, if any, pushback did you get from parents uh, about making your way in the world this way? Well, first of all, my mother was an ESL teacher for uh, children uh, from India my whole childhood. So I'm pretty familiar wow. uh, with 
what you're what you're speaking of. Um, but I had my parents were interesting. You know, my father, for the most part, worked in sociology and then research and statistics, um, and for a while worked for Mayor Koch in New York. Um, and my mom was obviously an elementary school teacher, but my mom was an artist. Uh, also, she still t- takes art classes and paints, I think, every day and has an art studio now she's built into her house. So for me, I don't see the difference between that of my mom uh, being a school teacher and doing her art all the time or going for it. <laughs> Either way, you're an artist, you know, Either way, she, she's just as much an artist as a, someone who's a professional painter because she does her craft all the time and works at it. So I think that was a really inspiring example. So I don't think that it was necessarily that it was um, discouraged in any way. I don't think that the, well, the one thing that was discouraged by my parents was going, if I was going to study theater in school to go, I, they didn't want me going to college in New York City or Los Angeles because they felt like if I was going to be pursuing that, that I would have my whole life to live in those cities and I should really go and have a real college experience. And I actually really agree with them now because I did end up living in both New York City and Los Angeles. And I cherish my time in upstate New York that I had in college. So that was the one thing that was discouraged. But the early days of navigating this were really rough. Uh, I mean, the jobs I had I mean, I was a a temp, a waitress. I was the worst temp because I had no computer skills. Uh, A waitress for one year. I mostly worked as a substitute teacher uh, to pay my bills. And then I bartended at the Bright Citizens Brigade Theater where I ended up performing and working as a teacher eventually. But first I bartended there. Um, And so, and, and there were days in my 20s in New York City where I would leave the house six in the morning to go substitute teach. Um, and then usually I would, I also worked in an after school program until six. And then I would go bartend from seven to midnight and come home. Uh, and so I would be gone from six in the morning till midnight. I mean, that, and none of that. And basically what I would do is I would prefer to work at the, um, upper grades when I subbed like upper grades in this elementary school where I subbed, which would be they went up to middle school. So anything from fifth grade and up, I, pr- I preferred because they were more independent and then I could sit and I could write um, at, the ta- at, at the desk while they were working. And there was a brief window where I worked in a, a, so- a soap store, a high-end soap store. And I worked and I never wrote more than the job at the high-end soap store. So, I mean, it was, it was challenging. And there was a million days of uh, what the heck am I doing with my life? A million times that I almost went to grad school, a million times that I almost, I, I was offered weird jobs out of state often. And I, oh, I wonder a lot about what would have happened if I had taken any of those. Um, so it was, it was an interesting decade, my twenties. None of this came, came through mm-hmm. until my thirties. Yeah. Yeah. Two things. What was the poorest you remember ever being okay. during that time? And why do you think you didn't quit? Oh my gosh. I don't, I mean, I always worked like crazy. I mean, I was broke all the time, but I mean, I think it was always a matter of, I can't, I, I don't know if I can say the poorest I ever felt because it was always just moments of, like sh- schlepping laundry in the rain on foot to a laundromat and feeling like shit or the, the schlepping groceries on foot in the snow and feeling like crap, you know, things like that. Uh, just, I just remember <laughs> that, that I always, that that would always be the moment would be like cl- what, cl- clunking the laundry down in those like New York city push carts things. They're called like old lady carts, pushing the laundry down in that, down the stairs and then in the rain to the laundromat. I just remember that would be this crap feeling. And then what was the second part of your question? Um, Why do you think you didn't quit? Oh, I, I don't know what what other way to be. Um, And uh, I, I, that's a hard thing to say. And I know it's a weird 
concept for people to understand, but I don't, I don't know how, how to be a normal person. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> so, um, I, I, like I try, I had this, okay. When I say I had all these jobs, I forgot about one. I had a temp job at Barney's, the fa- high end fashion com- company mm-hmm. where I worked in their offices and I wanted to be fired because, uh, I, 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 it was, a, it was an office setting and I do not function well in like a corporate office setting, but I could, because I was the first person to walk in there that wasn't trying to break into the fashion industry, I was really fine with just being the temp and I had no agenda. Um, they really liked me. It was like, I was not trying very hard. So, you know, I mean, that's life, that's dating. That's <laughs> funny how that works, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I kept getting it extended and moving to all these other departments. And I sat at a computer all day and I entered data, which to some people is peaceful. Um, but I really hated it. And I would get so tense and my shoulders would be so tense that, and I would on my break, uh, my lunch break leave. And I would do one of two things, which is I would go to this cheap nail salon and get a a 10 minute, $10 massage to get the tension out of my shoulders. Or I would go to St. Patrick's Cathedral and literally pray that my life would get better. And I would do one of those two things on my break, sometimes both. I'm also not a Catholic. So it was really strange that I was doing that. Um, And that's what I would do. So, and that was all I was doing was working in an office. It's not that bad. You know, yeah. some people lo- and a lot of the people that worked there loved it, but I didn't know how to do that. And I feel better. I would feel better with the uncertainty of, you know, when I say I tempt and I subbed, there's an uncertainty that comes with that of you don't know where you're working and every day is different and there's no predictability. And I thrive in something like that. So that's why when I finally got in with a few schools as a sub, that was really great for me because I really liked that every day was different and you never knew what was going to happen. Hey, it's Trini. I hope you're liking this episode of The Unmistakable Creative. Did you know that every Sunday, our community manager, Melina, sends out 10 key takeaways from episodes like this one? All you have to do to receive it is sign up for our newsletter. Just visit unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter and you'll get them delivered right to your inbox. Again, that's unmistakablecreative.com slash newsletter. Wow. Well, I can definitely relate to the office thing. And uh, it was funny because I've been fired from every job I've had just about. And really? I remember, you know, I was finally off of a performance improvement plan. I was, you know, I think three months away from heading to grad school and I got an accepted. So I literally just showed up at the office every day, loaded my iPod video at the time, you know, because we didn't have iPhones yet mm-hmm. uh, with every season of 24. And I would oh, just sit around and watch. Love 24. And the craziest part was when I resigned, they said, we're so sorry to see you go. You've become such a phenomenal example of leadership in the last <laughs> couple of months. Oh my gosh. But I, I I totally get you on that, especially because I was obsessed with that show as well. Yeah. I mean, I would have done anything to have had an opportunity to just quietly watch that anywhere. I was obsessed. Oh, with my that. ex-girlfriend regretted introducing me to that show. <laughs> she really was not happy because she was like, damn it. Now this is all you want to do. It was all uh, I wanted. I, I feel you. I yeah. really have an incredible respect for that piece of art. It was well, great. <laughs> I mean, Jack Bauer is just a badass human being, you know, like he doesn't badass. sleep shit. And the one and only time he tried to get laid, the person he was having sex with got shot. Right. And he doesn't eat <laughs> either. Let's not forget that. Yeah, that is true. He does all of that with no eating. My favorite was when he got, he was, a, he was being tortured and like sent away to be tortured for a year. And then he just walked out and was like, let's get started. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. You just like, got right back to work. Yeah. Like, oh man, way to recover. <laughs> uh, speaking of amazing stories, let's talk about how you go from all these sort of disparate jobs to becoming the grand slam champion at the moth <laughs> and writing this book. Because I think what I appreciated was, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of formulas, but when I looked at this framework, I thought, wow, this is really, really concrete and structured, yet there's so much flexibility in it yeah. that it would keep your story interesting, which is why I loved it. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, so the arc from this kind of uh, no man's land of my 20s into figuring out this out, uh, it, it also has to do with all the time that I was doing all these side jobs and and acting in commercials and, and small parts, you know, here and there that I was booking. Um, I also was doing stand up at night. 
And so, I mean, also on my off nights that I wasn't working until midnight, I would go and perform. I mean, it was insane. So it, it, say, it, when I say that this was a hard times, I also was in a strange way working my ass off at my craft and not under, not giving myself any credit for that now, as I'm saying you know, before when I said that to you. Uh, but I then started to hate stand up. Um, uh, I started to had this weird thing that I wanted to cancel every show I had. And I started to feel really wrong to me. And, uh, but I didn't know that there was another option. And then, um, I saw, I saw a storytelling show while I was bartending at UCB. And I thought this would be a really cool thing to get on. And then, um, I started reading and I remember reading a bunch of Spalding Gray books and a bunch of, uh, memoirs. And being really amazed by that form. And then I thought this would be interesting. So then I took, I considered going to, uh, that was another point where I considered going to grad school to, for writing at that point. And then I, I, my brother gave me some really sound advice that was some really, really interesting what he said to me. He said, well, you can go to grad school and be six figures in debt for writing. And you, there's no guarantee that you're going to become a writer after that. You know, whereas if you go to school and get the training to become a dental hygienist, you're going to get a job at the end of that, you know? And he is like, so you might as well, if you want to learn how to write properly, just take, take classes that you can actually afford and to, and just go for it. And I thought that was really great advice from, from my, my older brother. And so I did, and I took some memoir writing and some personal essay writing and things like of that sort. I took a bunch of classes, probably about five, um, and then started trying to tell these stories on stage in various forms and then started a storytelling show, uh, co-started with it with a friend. And, um, that was the beginning of it, but it, mo- it did be- begin more so with the writing of the stories than the telling, uh, the telling came after the writing. So yeah. And then uh, that evolved into, do you want to know the whole evolution after that of how it evolved into the book you, you read? Mm-hmm. Okay. So then I, uh, <laughs> I started telling stories and then I guess about a year or two into that, things were going really well in the New York city art scene in terms of when I started telling stories on stage, a lot of things changed in, in my life. Drastic. I mean, drastically changed. Um, I met my husband in that time. I moved in with him. We got married. I started uh, performing storytelling all the time and started to feel like the performer that I knew thought saw myself as in that ballet class in in college. I started to actually become that person. Uh, I started to, it started to very much things fell into place very quickly. Uh, A woman came to my show, uh, my storytelling show that worked at a huge ad, ad agency and she was a really cool outside the box thinker. And she was like, Hey, how about you come to my agency and start teaching the people here how to tell stories? <laughs> and, uh, I started working. I mean, so I had this like huge corporate storytelling job right away just because someone had seen my show. So it was like this magical thing of once I started mm. doing this, everything started to fall into place, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. 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 And then I started teaching uh, someone suggested I start teaching a friend of mine and I started teaching in a small, uh, independently. And I taught that class maybe twice. And then I pitched the class to UCB where I was, where I'd been performing and bartending and they were like, yeah, let's try it. And it really took off. And I created this whole curriculum there that they, that we're still using today. And, um, and then I tried to publish a book of a memoir book of stories because everything was going great in that department. And the book industry was really hard to break into. Um, I can relate. Yes. So my first book is called Gawky Tales of an Extra Long Awkward Face, and it's a memoir. And that took, I mean, I had an agent that, again, came to my show and was like, hey, you, you can do a book. And uh, and then he dropped me once I wrote the book. <laughs> he was like, I don't think this is good. I had, uh, then I had to go on another hunt to get a new agent. And then once I got her, we, which was took a while, then we sent out the book and it was rejected by everyone. And then we had to rebrand the whole book. And then she called me. I mean, by this point I had moved to Los Angeles. It was like so long to try to get this first book. Sold. <laughs> it was rejected everywhere. Yeah. And then I really, really, again, cause it, I keep coming back to writing for me was 
a big thing, you know, like going in that ballet class, I enjoyed writing down that story as much as I liked telling it. And I, when I started, wanted to start telling stories, I started with the learning how to write properly. And so it all comes down to that. So for me, I was like, no, I'm supposed to sell this book. I'm supposed to be a writer. I'm supposed to do this. And, um, I wouldn't let that dream go. And she called me and said, I've sent it out everywhere. I think we're going to have to let it go unless you have some sort of huge career break that makes you a household name. I just don't think it's going to (laughs) happen. And I was like, and and I cried and I mourned it. And then about, I I mean, I really cried harder about that than I have about, you know, people, (laughs) some people dying, (laughs) you know, I was really, it was like the death of this huge dream I had. And then she called me I think three days later and said, um, this has never happened to me, but a publisher changed their mind and they want the book. And wow. so then I sold the first, my first book and it came out and it had good critical reviews, but the sales weren't great. And, and, you know, it, I kind of had to s- start all over again with long story short, my agent stayed with me, but I had a different publisher and everything, you know? So no. Well, I've, I've been through that. I've just finished a, a two book contract with Penguin about a year ago. So, uh, and I'm kind of going through that. Oh, what now phase? Uh, Congratulations. Like, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's get into uh, long story short. I, I think that, you know, one of the things, like I said, I loved is that it was probably one of the most comprehensive and thoughtful frameworks I've ever seen, you know, in terms of one of these. In fact, like I have this mind map with all these branches and I was like, wow, I could take this mind map and I understand every bit of this, but you make a a very clear distinction between what storytelling is and what storytelling is not at the very beginning. You know, you say that story counting is, you know, storytelling is recounting true experience and it's not rants, therapy, or substitute for a political platform or stand-up comedy. Why do you think people confuse those two things? Storytelling and stand-up? Well, what storytelling is and what storytelling is not. Oh, well, I think right now, even since I wrote the book, there's been a bigger, um, bridge built between storytelling and stand up. The major difference in that thing is I would say pacing and laughs and stand up. You're bombing. If you don't get uh, laughs every, you know, a few seconds and in storytelling, you may not get a laugh for the first two, three minutes, or you may not get a laugh at all. But I mean, imagine a stand up set where no one laughs for three minutes, it would feel very uncomfortable. So that's, that's the main difference between storytelling and stand up is the pacing of the laughs and also the intentional jokes and stand up. If your jokes mm-hmm. are too intentional um, and storytelling rather than letting the, the experiences speak for themselves and, and your, I, I just say that I say, let the story speak for itself and let the story, the laughs come organically in storytelling. And with stand up, you do, you do need to write punchlines. Um, uh-huh. So, you know, that would be the major way that I think that they're, they're getting that there are differences, but I think there's tons of crossover, especially in some of these amazing TV specials that have come out lately. They've mm-hmm. been so story based. And I, I'm really, I for one, I'm very excited to see more of that yeah. um, and see stand up get really personal and get really vulnerable. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things you said is that people already have great stories that you're numb to your own experiences. It's your life. You live it every day and it's extremely boring to you, but it isn't boring at all. It's fascinating. I think that a lot of people think to themselves, okay, I'm not Elizabeth Gilbert. I haven't divorced my husband and traveled the world and spent all this time at an ashram. What the hell am I going to write about? Yes. Uh, and you say, don't be boring, live for the story and don't wait for things to happen to you. So you know, what do you say to the person who lives in like the middle of suburbia and basically feels like they're living Groundhog Day every day? I would say tell a story about something that affected you in any way. If you and and let your inner monologue and your response to that drive it. I just had this happen. I just taught a class 
And I had a woman in the class who was um, a working mom in her forties who told, who I think has had a very exciting life, but right now this phase of her life is not as exciting as some of the things that had happened before. She had had a very rich life, lived all over the place. And right now her life was pretty stable, you know, like what you just said. And she told this great story about (laughs) something that happened at a grocery store and a person being rude to her and everything that went on in her head and everything she wanted to say and, um, and everything that happened when she got home. And it was awesome and hilarious. And it was literally about like this whole thing of what was happening on the inside versus what was happening, actually happening in reality. And that's, and it was a story about a trip to a grocery store where the shopkeeper forgot to put something into her bag. That's it. Mm. That's it. Wow. (laughs) And it was brilliant. And I, and I, when I, you know, I wrote her, um, when I was inputting feedback for her, I said, I think your story was actually the most challenging to tell rather than some of the other ones that were about bigger things. You know, I mean, I have students that are wonderful that tell great stories about, you know, someone getting shot, big things like that. And a a story like that will work because it's a big Mm -hmm. story. But most of us, most of us only have one or two big stories. And then what else do you tell after that? Yeah. That's the problem. Uh, I think I, I really appreciated the fact that you also mentioned that, you know, when we get older, we have actually more to tell because we've lived more. Like I, I realized I couldn't have written my books when I was 20 something. I know because I went to college thinking I wanted to be the next F. Scott Fitzgerald uh-huh, and write a memoir. <laughs> and I, you know, I remember reading This Side of Paradise and I'm thinking, oh, you know what? I'm a freshman at Berkeley. I'm going to write my This Side of Paradise. And I'm like, right. I haven't had more than like three weeks of college experience. I have nothing to write yeah. about. Um The other thing you talk about is getting past fear. And I really loved this uh, really simple framework. It was almost like you gave us Mad Libs for telling our, our, you know, our stories. And you talked about, you know, throughout my life, I'm haunted by everywhere I go, secretly love, secretly hate. And I think that one of the things that I find with people who struggle to get past fear is they're so concerned with how the audience is going to respond to their work or even their own inner critic. Uh, And I'm curious, like, what would you tell those people? Because what I realized was that no matter what I write, uh, to this day, literally the only memory, you know, review from any of my books that I can quote you is from the woman who wrote me a two-star review and said, I hope this guy is a better surfer than he is a writer. Yeah. I mean, I remember I have many reviews up on my book. And the one I remember is the one who took a picture of it next to his hand and he gave it a bad review because it was too small. The book's too small. (laughs) <laughs> and that's the one I remember. <laughs> but also, wow. it's because it's pretty memorable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so how do you get past worrying with how the audience is going to respond? I mean, yeah. I don't know. When I, I got married, when I got married, I, I'm half Jewish. Um, my husband was raised in a very Catholic family. And my mm. mother was like, well, if you step on the glass at the end of your wedding, uh, your Jewish family is going to be upset because you didn't do a traditionally Jewish ceremony. And if you don't do, you know, have to mention of God in your wedding, then your, your husband's family is going to be upset because they're so, and it was all this stuff. And I was like, well, no matter what I do, it would be impossible to please every single person watching this wedding. It's going to be impossible because everybody has different backgrounds. So all I can do is have the wedding I want and hope that people like it the best they can. And I had a great wedding. And I had a great ceremony and I stepped on a glass and I went up in a chair and I didn't mention God. And my uh, non-denominational minister accidentally kept referring to my husband, Dan, as Danielle for some reason, which was really funny. And um, (laughs) I guess she was used to more hip weddings than what I was having. But, uh, and it was, it was, it was great. And, and if they didn't like it, they kept it to themselves and I had a great time. And so I, I think I kind of carry that over into performing, which is like, yeah, it's going to be impossible to please everybody. Like it's just impossible. Uh, Mm -hmm. You could have a movie that everyone loved, you know, and then there's a million people that hated it at also. And that's, there's just no way there's just, I don't know. I don't know anything that aside from maybe like Betty White, that every single person loves and nobody dislikes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, well, it's funny you're talking about mundane moments because, like, when you said that, I couldn't help but think of uh, I, I, you may have seen it. Andrea Savage has this incredible show called "I'm Sorry." Yeah, I haven't uh, seen it, but I know I know some friends that write on it. Yeah, hilarious! Like they take the most ridiculous moments. Like you know, the the opening shot of the show is about her four year old daughter asking her about vaginas <laughs> you know, in a public setting, yeah. and you just listen to this explanation and you're like, 
okay, this is going to be amazing. Like we couldn't stop watching. Um, so I think that that makes a, a natural segue to, you know, sort of the other components of getting started. You talk about the truth, a universal theme and a thesis based story. Like, how do you find those things in a particular story? I think you've got to put it down. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I have a show Monday, for example, right? And I wrote a piece and I had to put it down and think about it to go back and say, what are, what are the, uni- what is this universal theme of the story? What is this really about? And how can I pepper that in and have that motivate this piece? But if I write it <clears throat> with the intention of having that, it's challenging. I think it's a matter of looking at it, getting, gaining perspective, thinking about it, and then coming back to it. So you need to give mm-hmm. yourself space from it. I've also found that, um, and I don't think I'm the first to say this, that giving yourself space from something after you write, like putting it away and then coming back to it, usually I'll come back to something and be like, wow, I'm a much better writer than I thought I was, or this is much better than I thought it was. Whereas if I had stared at it for three days straight, I would have decided it was terrible. But if I put it down for mm-hmm. three days and then come back to it, it's actually not so bad, or it's actually kind of great. Um, yeah. I mean, part of the art the process is thinking that the art sucks. Uh, yeah. and then rising to action despite that, you know? Mm, Yeah. So I think, you know, in part two, you get into what are sort of the core elements of storytelling. You talk about passion, uh, layering a story and perspective. So let's start there. I mean, passion, I think is such a, it's funny because, you know, it's overused in some ways. I think that, you know, the internet and all the self-help articles have kind of done, you know, an injustice to the word passion. Uh, but in the concept of, in the context of storytelling, um, how do you incorporate it? Like what, how do you, when you look at a story, how can you tell that the writer or the storyteller has infused it with passion? Um, I think in the way that they tell it or in how much, <sighs> a hard question. Um, it, it's often in the delivery, uh, or how much time they spend talking about something Um, if they give, for example, if if I were to tell a story about writing something, I would give the pen I was writing with a lot of time to, I would spend a lot of time on what pen I used and why, because that's something that I'm really passionate about pens and I'm a complete pen snob. And that would, so it's a matter of that. I would spend time on that pen, whereas someone would just say, I picked up the pen and began to write. That makes sense. So it's a matter of the time you give something in a story. And mm-hmm. it's also a matter of the way that you tell it. Um, I think that I've seen passion where something on paper may not work and then a person telling it, it can really come alive. So I think that that's a big one is um, performance and length of time you spend on something would show me how passionate you are in it. You know, it's it's funny you say that because I'm I'm making a documentary right now about the women in my family and the fact that they cook with no recipes, um, and that they didn't learn from their mothers and there's no you know generational secrets. And my roommate and I were watching the interview that I did with my mom, and he commented and he said, you know, he said I've seen your mom multiple times, and in that moment she looks happier mm-hmm. than anything any other moment I've ever seen mm-hmm. her. Um, and she was describing the first meal that she made for my yeah. dad which actually didn't turn out well, yeah. but it was, you could see her light up talking about food. And I was like, wow, I think I found what it is. It, like this may be the one common ground we have where we're not going to kill each other. Yeah. I do think when a person lights up, the whole room lights up, whether you agree or not. Uh, ju- ju- just yesterday, one of my students asked me, well, who do you think's the best uh, singer to come from New Jersey? I'm from New Jersey. And I think he, and I was like, in my heart, <laughs> I go, Truly in my heart, above Brewster Bon Jovi is Whitney Houston. And he was like, what? And I was like, no, she's my favorite. And I'm from where Bruce and Bon Jovi are from. I mean, I'm from that part of Jersey. And he was like, what do you mean? And then I started talking about Whitney Houston (laughs) in a way that I felt like time stopped. Like He was like, tell me more about Whitney Houston. I just couldn't stop talking about my face was lighting up. And then I got everyone involved and I was, you know, and people were singing and it was like, because I, and I don't think anybody agreed with me. I think everyone would say that Bruce is the best, you know? And I think if, I hope no one from my hometown is listening because I'm going to get slaughtered for saying that. But um, (laughs) I, it was amazing to see this room of people light up. And eventually by the end, they're all like, she's the greatest artist to ever live. Like it was just, you know, cause I, I love her. Uh, yeah. Specifically the bodyguard era. I love it. And, um, 
And I really, really feel passionately about it. So it was really interesting. Even conversationally, you can see it. When a person feels passionately, uh-huh. you can turn a room and get everyone to stop and listen and get involved, whether they agree or not. And I'm sure no one agreed with me. Um, yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite ways to spread the message of our mission here at The Unmistakable Creative is through speaking. In the last two years, I've delivered keynotes and workshops to professional associations, large companies like Citibank and Meredith Corp, and even small ones on how creativity can lead to better working environments, fuel innovation, and increase the bottom line. So if you think I'd be a fit for your upcoming event and want to learn more, visit speaking.unmistakablecreative.com and get in touch. Again, that's speaking.unmistakablecreative.com. So in the interest of time, I'm going to do this in an incredibly selfish way. You have all these concepts and I was thinking to myself, how would we make this interesting? So what if I gave you the headline for two stories from my life? Could you walk me through how I would tell them differently? Uh, We can try. Sure. Okay. I'll give you two. I was held up at gunpoint after a high speed car chase in Tijuana when I was in college. Um, And I was 41 and single at my sister's wedding without a date. Choose whichever one you think would be the one that you could let me apply the framework to. I could apply the framework to either. The one that I think okay. is more interesting is being 41 and single at the sister's wedding because um, I hear stories of people getting held up and things all the time because people go to, like I said, people's go-to stories are the big things, the big things that have happened to mm-hmm. them. And I prefer hearing about smaller things that have happened to people. I think that they're more, I think that, that those are sometimes even more fun stories to hear. So let's do that one. Okay, great. So you talk about layering a story, perspective, character, rooting for the storyteller, full circle, um, someone else's story, the unexpected and the benign. So let's, I realize I'm trying to do something very ambitious in 15 minutes, okay. but given that story, where do we start? Intro, start at the beginning. How are you 41 and single? What, did, what was your dating history before that? Well, I don't want to bore our audience because they've probably heard some of this before. So let's just say that most of my relationships haven't worked out. That's not enough. And that's not vulnerable enough. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Let's see. I was in a serious relationship when I was 25 for the first time. Never had a girlfriend in college. Uh, I knew that I was going to break up with the girl I was dating when I was 25 within three (laughs) weeks of dating her. And I dated her for a whole year. Uh, I knew that I was going to break up with the second girl within three weeks of dating her. But the sex was amazing. So I stayed in the relationship, even though I knew I was leaving for grad school. And she actually had an abortion while we were dating. Uh, of your and child then or someone else's I was child? Living, no, okay. my child. <laughs> well, I think I'd like to think unless, you know, she was doing something while I was at work that I don't right. know about. Uh, and then I went to grad school and after grad school, I didn't have a job and I was living at my parents' house for the better part of eight years. So other than a failed attempt at a long distance relationship, I had no other relationship. Hence the fact that I am 41 and single and I didn't meet anybody in the two and a half or three years I was living in San Diego. So that brings me to being 41 and single at my sister's wedding. All right. So what were you doing in San Diego? Um, I moved there because the surf was good. And, uh, you know, I knew when I had moved to my parents, I'd started surfing 10 years ago. So I knew that, you know, when I moved out of my parents, wherever I was going to go, it was going to be near the water. But what did you do in besides surf in San Diego? Were you working? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was writing my second book. Okay. So I think I would phrase that kind of, I went to, uh, so I was 41 and single at my sister's wedding. I don't even know if I would start there. I would say, I I would probably start with, I went to Berkeley and despite Berkeley's reputation of being free spirited in love, I ended up being the first person ever to graduate there who didn't date anyone. Um, (laughs) like that. Um, and then due to my I don't want to diagnose you here, but like due to a crippling fear of confrontation, I ended up staying in a couple of long-term relationships. It should have been about one date long. And then, uh, uh, I moved to San Diego, which is, which is a, you know, a fun surfing town, which is very social, except if you're there sitting alone in your apartment, working on your novel, something like that. Okay, cool. I would phrase so- it like that. Yeah. Like it's a quick, yeah. quick, 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 quick. So we root for you. You're an underdog. We get it. You're a likable character um, in those first few sentences. And then everything else we don't need. Okay. 
I like it. I'm glad you, you were able to summarize it quickly. So I guess, you know, where, like, what elements of the framework did you pull in there? Like where, you know, where does layering, you know, like, what do you mean by layering a story perspective? It, it makes sense to me, you know, about the idea of whether you're, you've actually moved on from something, um, because I feel like often people will use their audience as their therapist when yes, they write. Yes, yes, like, yes. And I'm guilty of that. I've been guilty and of that. so have I. I mean, that's how I learned not to do that. Yeah. Um, but what was your question? I guess, you know, when, if you look back at the story, you know, what you just did with my story, you know, where do, where were you layering, where were you using perspective, you know, all that. That's like not the how... story. That's just the intro. We haven't even gotten to the story. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, that's just the intro of the story. That's how I would start and introduce it. And that's the first chunk. We uh, The meat of the story gotcha. is the story of you're at this wedding and what happens. Um, okay. Not because it's, it, I mean, does something happen at this wedding? Oh yeah, this was by far the you know what what I thought was going to be the worst experience of my life. I realized two things: first off, that this wasn't about me; that it was about my sister, and that I look really good in a tux and I give good speeches. So I put up uh, a slide with my phone number on the screen and told all the Indian aunties that if they wanted to know when I was getting married, they could text profiles, pictures, and all other relevant information to that number and that I was expecting a full report on their progress by the end of the week. And they have turned out to be the worst unpaid employees in the world. Not only that, I got a paid speaking gig out of my sister's wedding speech. Okay. So you got a paid speaking gig and no dates. No dates. (laughs) Sadly, these women are completely useless. Like I I told my mom, I was like, we should have a conference call and it should be like the apprentice where every week I fire one of them, uh, you know, except, you know, we won't even go there, but you know, you, you get where I'm going. Okay. So then you get a paid public speaking gig out of it. And is that, were you at some sort of a, see, I would dig more into this. So were you at some sort of a crossroads in your life of not knowing what you wanted to do? Was public speaking something you were trying to get into? No, no, not at all. I mean, I've been doing, you know, speeches for a long time. In fact, because I've, you know, done a lot of keynote speeches, I wrote all the speeches for my family members. Okay. So then you don't get a date out of it or you do you even get one date no. out of it? I didn't get a single date out of it, but I did, like I said, make $2,500 out of it. People thought I charged my sister for her wedding speech. So you make $2,500 out of it. And what do you do with that money? That's a good question. I don't remember, to be honest. You don't know. You know what it is? I actually booked a ticket to India for a surf trip. And what happens on the surf trip? I'm just trying to dig everything in out of uh, this. Um, I basically spent the entire time working on a book proposal for a book that doesn't look like it's going to be published. Okay. That's not a good ending. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> let's not end it with that. Uh, let's, let's find yeah. a different thing to end it with. So what I would say is, are you single now? I am single now. I actually ended up leaving San Diego. I moved to Colorado. Oh, okay, great. So, <sighs> What I think what I look for in a story with a person is they have a story and then I go, well, what, who are you at the top of the story and who are you at the end and what has changed, right? So if you are at the top, you can't tell a story where at the top of the story, you are a single writer uh, who is cool with that and at the end be that same person, right? Like we have to see some sort of arc in you. That's, I mean, that's everything. So what would you say changes within you? Well, I think the the big change was initially I was really depressed and really down Ooh. about it. I saw it as like the worst thing in the world. I thought this is so embarrassing. I mean, being 41 and single in Indian at a, a wedding is the most sacrilegious thing, particularly your sister's wedding. And it turned out not to be anywhere as near as bad. In fact, it turned out to be wonderful. People came up to me all night telling me how much they enjoyed my speech, uh, you know, I think that was the real transformation was that it was a real shift in perspective. I didn't see what initially I saw as like a low point in my life. I actually saw as an opportunity and that changed. Right. That's great. That's good enough. So that's the layering of a story that I'm talking about is I have a people look at a story and go, what is this really about? looks like a simple story about a good, giving a good speech, but actually it's about you coming to grips with, Hey, I have a pretty decent life here. You know, Mm. Um, it reminds me of a story a student told that I loved, which was that his brother or somebody called him and was like, I'm getting lottery tickets for the family. You want in the lottery in our hometown is this much money, you know? And he's like, yeah, get me, get me a few tickets. And then he was in his car and he was thinking, what would I do if I won? And he went through this whole thing and he was like, 
would I would get a car and he was like, no, I like my Prius. It's not so bad. And then it was like, and then he was like, I get, I get a new place. I was like, no, I live in a great neighborhood. What's like, who I hate. And the whole story was about how in the beginning of it, before he hadn't even won anything, you know? And, but he really actually, when he thought about what he would change, came to grips with like that his life was pretty damn good. He had it pretty good and he didn't see it that way. He was always wanting something more. Um, uh, and that's what this reminds me of. And that was a really effective story where even less happened than this. He just bought a lottery ticket. And in this situation, it's like you get up and you're celebrated. You're pe- you get paid work out of it. Uh, you're charming. You get to go on a t- trip from it. You get to you move. I mean, all of these things happen. And you do have this freedom because you aren't tied down. Uh, mm-hmm. And maybe it's not the worst thing in the world because your life is pretty damn awesome. And and you're, you don't have, have to feel any sort of weirdness about it. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it was, <laughs> it had a, I got to avoid a lot of awkward conversations that probably would have happened afterwards. Um, instead, it was basically, you know, my mom's friends coming up to me. I'm like, get to work. You've been given your marching right. orders. There's nothing for us to right. talk about. So, you know, what you did is that you took what often felt like a, an elephant in the room or this stupid thing that you had to talk about, which is so dumb because who cares if you're single? I, I could care less, but yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. that, that you're just like, Hey everybody, I'm single. Isn't, and this is the deal. And here's my deal. And I'm putting it all out there. And it, yeah. and you were rewarded for it. I think that that's great. I just mm-hmm. saw a guy get on stage a week ago and the, and he's this really good looking guy. And the first line of his story was, I just turned 60, which is like, I think age is so funny because some people it's part of their brand and some people hide it and some people, whatever. Right. But this guy, uh, the first line of his story was that, I mean, round of applause, everyone loving him, everyone walking up to him afterward for like skincare and diet tips. I mean, it was like, he just owned it. It was great. So, I mean, I think that that's awesome. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, you know, one thing, you know, so we're talking about sort of, perspective and vulnerability. And I'd been, I remember having a conversation with this woman where we were talking about the fact that often, you know, particularly in the sort of personal development space where a lot of our guests come from, people are guilty of using their vulnerability as a marketing tactic. What do you mean by that? Like where, can you give me an example of that? Yeah. I mean, it's very much related to that perspective of we kind of air our dirty laundry on Facebook Uh, um, because it gets attention and, or, you know, just that's one example, Facebook or or wherever it is, you air your dirty laundry with the audience. It's extremely vulnerable. And I'll I'll give you an example. There was a point right after my book came out where I was feeling really, really down. And I was writing about this idea of being like just addicted to achievement Mm -hmm. and getting me nowhere. My sister actually read it and she, she texted me and she said, you know what? She said, people hire you to speak right. at their events and at their company. You shouldn't write stuff like this. And if you are going to write it, keep it to yourself. That was hard to hear, but she hmm. wasn't wrong. I mean, how do I feel about that? Yeah. I mean, where's, where's the line? Like, I, you know, I mean, you talk about the fact that, okay, yes, let's make sure that you've moved on from this. And even Danielle Laporte once told me she doesn't write about a painful experience until I, she's I, done I would agree. I would completely agree with that. Yeah. Um, I think that to be honest, that's why I left Facebook, uh, specifically Facebook, because I did kind of have trouble ingesting that much of, of, of of that kind of, I mean, I'm not going to say it better than there was a line on the show, Barry, that called it competitive grief. Mm. And, um, Wow. I have, I, yeah, I, I, I wish I could have. I'm going to steal, that, steal that for finishing the blog post that I've been working on about this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a line from the TV show, Barry, she calls it, you know, in an acting class, they're doing competitive grief. And I thought that was a really great way of putting it. Yeah. Um, and I see it sometimes in live storytelling shows, a, a live version of it, which is a person will get up and say, you know, I just survived cancer. I'm a cancer survivor and everyone will love the story. And then the next person will get up and say, well, I'm a cancer survivor. And I was, uh, in New York, uh, during nine 11. And then people will love that. And then the next person gets up, I'm a cancer survivor. And I was in New York for nine 11 and, and, um, I have an artificial leg. And then the next, it's like this thing, like, it's like this competition of who, who has been through the most. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that we're doing that on social media as well at times. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that, that that breeds, it's hard to find the line. I don't know. I don't know. I know that I personally have trouble reading a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and it might be because I hear a lot of it on stage and I have to deal with a lot of very heavy things in my work. Mm. Um, but I do have trouble reading it. I can't put my finger on why that being said though, I get really excited. I'm going to completely contradict myself here. I love when I see, um, like those Michael uh, Phelps commercials where he talks about his anxiety and, and, and what he did to combat that and how he got help and you should too. I, I yeah. love seeing someone like that using it for good. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm really moved by that and really impressed that a figure like that, who I would say even 10 years ago would have to be perfect in order to maintain anything is allowed to be vulnerable and real. So I struggle with both sides of it. Um, yeah. it's, I, I don't know. I don't know why I love that Michael, my, those Michael Phelps commercials, but had to leave Facebook because I had trouble reading all that stuff all the time. I don't know. Maybe I'm too sensitive. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I think we all know that, you know, there's sort of an emotional resonance to transparency, authenticity, authenticity and vulnerability. Uh, and yet sometimes we, I think, like you said, we, we, we lose the line, but I think in that search for emotional resonance, we will actually go past probably what a limit is when it comes to this. I mean, I don't know. It might be really healthy yeah. for some people. It might really help people. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know that I'm the right person to answer this. I'm not a huge, a social media user for, and I think a lot of it is that I, live social media in real life in the sense that if people are very vulnerable and real and confess things to me all the time in a classroom setting or on stage, et cetera. So I, 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 I hear so much that I sometimes need to shut it down. Like I, I read mysteries before bed because it's just too much or a podcast I listen to. It's usually something that isn't too heavy, you know, because I need an escape. Yeah. Um, so one final thing I want to ask you about is the business side of this, because, you know, you talk about the business of storytelling in the last chapter. And one thing that I look at when I see businesses is many of them, particularly like, you know, I, I often speak at conferences and, you know, when it's a, a corporate person giving a presentation, I listen to their presentations. I was like, wow, this is a deck you might as well have just emailed to people. This isn't particularly interesting. Um, but then when you see people who are doing personal projects, they're fascinating. So like, yeah. why is that? How do you bridge that gap? In corporate storytelling? Yeah. I think you've got to, I mean, this is the thing is going back to that vulnerability thing. It's a really, it's a really complicated thing because I think a lot of corporate people in those presentations are afraid to have any vulnerability in terms of they'll talk about only success, but no failure or Mm -hmm. how, or journey. And what people tap into is the failure and the journey. So I think if you include those things, people will be more interested in it rather than just doing um, a presentation on facts, numbers, and results, which is at times doesn't resonate with people. Journey, mistakes, failure, bumps along the way, people do relate to. And then the more personal you can make the presentation, the better. So if you can add any sort of personal story into it rather than facts and numbers, I think people will really, really tap into it as well. Mm, wow. It, it's funny. I feel like I could talk to you for like two or three hours about this because uh, <laughs> it's such a deep rabbit hole. Like I didn't even get to, to cover, like I was looking at the mind map and thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, how do we cover all this in an hour? And I was like, okay, now I can see why you have to teach an entire class on this because uh, I mean, you included so much in the book. And I think that for me, like I said, uh, even as somebody who has spent 10 years writing every single day and you know done the podcast, I found that it was a, a way of excavating stories out of me that I didn't even know I had. And also, you know, learning to tell existing stories better. Like it just makes me think about how I would tell a story to somebody. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. So I have one final question for you, uh, which is how we finish all of our interviews. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? I think that if they can't survive without doing that thing, that person is unmistakable in that. And I think it goes back to what I said about my mom. My mom doesn't feel whole unless she's doing her art also all the time. And that, and therefore she's unmistakable for that. I think that if a person doesn't feel whole without having this thing in their life, do as a part of their life, this creative outlet, then that would make that person unmistakable for what they do and the art that they create. And whether they do that for a living or they do that on Saturdays for two hours or whatever that may be, if you can't live without it, you're unmistakable for that. And you will be remembered 
for that. Amazing. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to join us and share your story and your wisdom and your insights with our listeners. Where can people find out more about you, your work, and everything else that you're up to? Uh, it's all on my website, margolightman.com. I, I do have Instagram, like I said, but I'm not a huge social media person. So um, uh, I, I usually I'm pretty good about updating my site of all my appearances, or you can find me on Instagram under my name as well. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.